well. As we continue in a sermon series exploring stress and how we respond as people of faith, we are in the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. You pray with me. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be found acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Early on in the book of Acts, we pick up the story of the early Jesus movement as they are in a period of drastic transitions. Some of those major transitions are negative. Jesus, their rabbi and friend, has been arrested and crucified and buried. Some disciples betrayed him. Others denied him. All but the women deserted him. Death, fear, and uncertainty rule the day. Alternatively, the early Jesus movement is also experiencing the elation and the joy of other transitions. Some of Jesus' disciples have had an experience of the risen Christ. A new disciple joins the fold to replace Judas. The Holy Spirit bewilders and amazes on Pentecost. And the author of Acts relays that thousands are being baptized and devoting themselves to a life of discipleship. One could easily wonder how this fledgling community found grounding, rootedness, and consistency in the midst of such pendulum swings. How did they arise from the depths of grief and despair following Jesus' death? How did they ease back down from the swirling spiritual heights of speaking in tongues on Pentecost and person after person wading into the waters of baptism. What happened to their individual identities in these moments? Did Judas' betrayal come to define him? Did that lead to his death? Did Peter's denial distance him from the community for a time? Could he sense them whisper about him in his presence? Did they not know what to say to him when they bumped into him in the marketplace? Did these transitions from disciple to betrayer, from disciple to denier, come to define them? How about the other end of the pendulum swing? Did those Pentecost witnesses, those arising from the waters of baptism, did they settle into a life of discipleship? Or did they continue chasing that spiritual high, always on to the next new thing, eventually burning out or walking away? Transitions. Good or bad, challenging or inspiring, negative or positive, they all bring Stress. They both upend and redefine our identity. And if you live long enough, you'll experience perhaps not all of them, but many of them. Major transitions, like an addition to your world. The birth of a child, an 
adoption, or a blossoming new relationship, or the subtraction from your world, the death of a loved one, or the fracturing of a relationship. Major transitions, the promotion at work, the new position or title, the raise or the bonus, or the ending of work, the unexpected, like a layoff, or the planned, like retirement. What happens to our identity in these transitions? How do we navigate them as people of faith? Transitions. Uprooting your family and moving. Becoming the new student at school. Becoming the caregiver for an aging spouse. Or for your aging parents. When your body stops working the way you want. Major transitions. Identity shifts. We might even wonder, where is God in the middle of all this? Does how I see myself in times of transition coincide with the way that I'm seen by God? Am I striving toward the ideals and expectations of society? Or the ideals and expectations of God? As Thomas Merton warns, we can spend our entire life climbing the ladder of success only to find when we get to the top that our ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. I'm afraid that the expectation, especially the American expectation, in times of stress and transition is to suck it up. Gut it out. Do not show emotion. Play hurt. Do not ask for help. Relying upon others is a sign of weakness. We celebrate that iconic image of the rugged individual who thrives against all odds to overcome adversity all by themselves. The self-made man. Pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. To accept help makes you a burden upon others. Does this sound familiar? And isn't it counter to pretty much every story in Scripture? Think about all the people who needed help. Adam needed help from Eve. Moses needed help from Aaron. Naomi needed help from Ruth. David needed help from Jonathan and Nathan. In becoming Paul, Saul needed help from Ananias. Mordecai needed help from Esther. The paralytic is lowered through the ceiling by his friends. The prodigal needed help from the father. Jesus is helped by Simon of Cyrene. And the list goes on and on. I've been trying to think of a story of a self-made individual in the scriptures. One of those no help needed. I made it on my own kind of stories. To this day, I'm coming up blank. Doesn't mean it's not there. I just can't find it. If you find it, I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> Why then do we allow our societal expectations to override the expectations of our faith? This past fall, my father-in-law passed away. As news began to spread, we received a message from a church member offering to bring us a meal. And my first instinct, my knee-jerk reaction was to refuse. I thought, I'm a fully functional adult, more than capable of cooking a simple meal. I thought, I'm a devoted and capable father, more than able to juggle getting my kids ready to go back to school the next morning and preparing a meal without having time to go to the store. I thought, I don't want these people to come into our messy home. They'll take one look at our yogurt-stained dinner table and our unkempt living room and stacks of unopened mail by the door and think, 
Oh, this is how the snows really live. I thought we're tired and we're grieving and we're vulnerable. What will they think if they see us like this? Frazzled, crying, worn. With my culture on one shoulder saying, suck it up, Kevin. Refuse their help. Don't show weakness. You can pull this all together. And my faith on my other shoulder saying, this is Christian community, Kevin. Practice what you preach. You do not have to do this alone. You should not do this alone. We made a decision. We said yes. We accepted the help. But thank God we did. It was a complete gift. A breath of fresh air. A reassurance that things would be okay when it seemed like they would not. And two days later, this individual even sent a text that said, we would love to have your kids over for a while tomorrow night so you and Katie can have some time together. This was not just compassionate, this was extravagant. This was not just a kind gesture, this was Christ-like community. The funeral service would not be held immediately, but several months later. And as we prepared to head back east, a second offer from a different couple was extended. And even having had the first experience, I wrestled again. Same hesitations, same worries, and I wanted to decline. We had already received one meal, surely two was unnecessary. If I allow others to care for me, won't I become beholden to them? Won't I somehow owe them? Again, my cultural expectations, they held me back, but my faith nudged me toward acceptance. And thank God we did. During the trip, our children made the executive decision not to sleep. We returned physically exhausted and emotionally drained. And as an additional bonus, our daughter got strep throat and torticollis on the trip. It's a medical condition that locked her neck into place. We were worried. That simple meal was our saving grace. That homemade applesauce they brought was the only thing that my daughter would or could eat. The meal allowed us to focus on doctor's visits and physical rest and emotional recovery. Accepting help allowed us to grieve, to rest, to recover. It was the church in action. It was not just compassionate, it was extravagant. Jesus frequently preached extravagance. Instead of an eye for an eye, Jesus went to the extreme, turned the other cheek as well. Instead of just giving your coat, Jesus went to the extreme and give your cloak as well. Instead of going the one mile, Jesus went to the extreme. Go the second mile as well. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus goes to the extreme. Love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. Extravagance. These families showed our family extravagant grace. Grace that I almost made the mistake of refusing. The early Jesus movement and Acts, those followers of the way, they put aside social expectations in order to live an extravagant faith in the midst of transitions and stress. Did they literally sell all their possessions and distribute their goods? I don't know. But the extravagance is not lost on me. In the midst of major transitions, major stressors, these believers provided stability and support to one another. Day by day, the scripture reads, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. This congregation is both 
wiser and more faithful than I will ever be. So I ask you frequently for your advice and wisdom. And over these past weeks, several of you have offered it. Ask some folks to reflect on life's greatest transitions to answer two questions. One, what do you wish someone had offered you during this transition? And two, what did someone do for you you hadn't expected that made a big difference? And the responses began to weave some common threads. One common thread was, make yourself available for others. A listening ear, or a meal, or an errand. Offer yourself to someone in need. They said, but this also requires a willingness to let others in on the other end. And receiving help can be more difficult than offering help. Second thread focused on self-care. These wise folks advised to take time to focus on the needs of the self in the midst of stressful transitions. Dr. Silvers offered us the freedom last Sunday to say no when we can't give ourselves fully to one more commitment. I read recently of a self-care practice one person holds. They have a special email folder marked NO in capital letters where they archive requests or invitations that they've had to say no to. Then the next time they're feeling overwhelmed, they browse the NO folder to realize how much more overwhelmed and drained they would be had they said yes to all those invitations. The third thread of advice from the wisest among us was this, and I think it's the most important. Trust that you are enough. They said, trust that you are enough. You're enough. You're enough before God. Is there always room for growth? There sure is. Is there always the need for repentance? Of course. But know that you are enough. At least before God. I'm not so sure you can slack off at home and leave the laundry undone and the dishes pile up and then say to your partner, Honey, Pastor Kevin said that I was enough. I doubt you can perform poorly at work or turn in subpar assignments at school and then say to your boss or your teacher, you know, Pastor Kevin, he told me I was enough. You are enough before God. It almost sounds silly, doesn't it? As if it could not possibly be so. But it is. You are enough. It's what Paul Tillich writes in his most famous sermon. You are accepted. You are accepted by that which is greater than you, and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now, perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now, perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything, do not perform anything, do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. I asked one of the wisest among us this week what Lee Summit Christian Church is known for in our community. She didn't say the music, although she could have. She didn't say the preaching, much to my disappointment. She didn't say our longtime presence as a 150 year old congregation, although she could have. She said our compassion and our care. That's what we're known for. That sounds like enough to me. Thanks be to God this day.